All right, are, are you going to say go? Is there going to be a gun? Oh. All right. Should I? All right. Go for it. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to the uh, innovations program. Very excited about uh, you hearing about our project for the next five minutes. Um, hopefully, this is not a, not a situation where the, the best is saved for last. It's actually first this time. And I'd like to just say that um, uh, it's very interesting, you know, process compressing 10 years of work into a five-minute commercialization plan. So I'm going to tell you about our biologics program in, in asthma and cancer against chitinases and chitinase-like molecules. So here's our development team. It's a collaborative project between Brown and Yale. Uh, Dr. Jack Elias, who's the dean at Brown, who was here originally, myself, a translational scientist in lung disease with specific interest in asthma, Chun Gun Lee, a uh, lead scientist up at Brown, and Lauren Cohn, who is an associate director at Yale and an immunologist. So the molecules that we're interested in blocking here are chitinases and chitinase-like molecules. They are really juxtaposed in many ways. One is with the environment. Uh, they modulate the exposure to chitin-containing organisms, which are, you know, widely expressed in, in, um, on the planet in, in parasites as well as uh, other organisms. And they drive inflammation and tissue fibrosis, modulating the responses in the airway here. Oh, excuse me. They are also control epithelial damage and uh, homeostasis and proliferation and are very relevant in cancer models. We found that they were overexpressed in asthma, and as you can see here in the picture, the, um, in normal individuals there's very little, but as you see increasing amounts of red staining in this airway of humans, this is human asthma with severe patients here, you can see widespread staining in the airway wall. And in cancer models, they're overexpressed as well. The slide did not come through, here it is. And what you can see here in a melanoma metastasis model is that Animals knocked out for the gene do not develop metastases or when they're treated with an anti-YKL40 uh, biologic. So we've been developing a biologic against this drug funded by NIH uh, with $5 million drug development uh, grant, and we are currently ending year three of that program. What you have here is some of our preclinical data looking at blockade using our lead candidate. And here on the left, you can see the asthma model where allergic inflammation in the airway wall of the mouse is blocked with different doses in a dose response manner. And our target uh, response uh, uh, tyrosine uh, uh, transcription factor is blocked as well. And here you can see some impressive anti cancer effects. On the left here, there's an, a control antibody uh, animal with a, a lung cancer model, blockade with our biologic drug. And then over here on the right, you see the melanoma metastasis model here. Uh, animals treated with a control antibody, but when they're injected uh, with uh, our biologic drug as well as melanoma cancer cells, they do not metastasize to the lung. So we have an intellectual property portfolio. We have three issued patents, and we're currently developing a provisional patent uh, on the uh, composition of matter of our, our drug. Uh, we have uh, several uh, lead candidates currently. And right now in our development program, this is where we are, we have $5 million of funding. We have uh, $2 million coming down the pike, and we are currently here finishing optimization of the lead candidate. We're going to embark on uh, non-GLP primate tox and hopefully be submitting for IND uh, in phase one in the next uh, two years. Thank you very much. Um, this, ha this, uh, the lead can the question is, has this been tested in a pulmonary fibrosis model? Uh, there is a lot of data showing there's modulation of YKL40 in pulmonary fibrosis, but we have not tested the lead in that model yet, but we, those are, those studies are planned. What's the unmet need, the asthma model, how do you see this differentiating? 
Yeah, so this molecule overlaps between T2 and non-T2 inflammation and also plays a role in airway remodeling and fibrosis. So we see it specifically targeted for patients with significant airway remodeling and low lung function and patients with non-T2 asthma, non-allergic asthma. You, uh, you, you have uh, issued patents, it looked like, so this, the, the three, is, three issued. Um, back quite a ways. Yes, those, so those are methods patents and we're currently submitted, planning to submit uh, IP provisional patents for the composition of matter. Is it? Oh, it works. <laughs> yeah. Are you using the same antibody for both um, asthma and for oncology indications? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, next up, Vaso Rx. Michael, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I'm actually going to tell you a story uh, about control of uh, about control of about control of sort of atherosclerotic plaque, one of the major causes of one of the major causes of vascular disease. The plaque forms because of uh, uh, because of because of chronic because of of chronic inflammatory uh, response in the wall. And to date, there are no therapies that, that either effectively stop it, stop it or, or induce it, so, or, induce it or, or induce it sort of, or, or, or induce it sort of regression. Um, the, key points that, the key points that I'm going to tell you about it, that we have, we have the, the, current state, the, the current state of therapy involves the use of statin and similar, and similar drugs that slow down but do not stop and, um, and, and do not reverse the uh, disease. We have identified, uh, we have identified as the key molecular pathway responsible for plaque maintenance of, for plaque maintenance, uh, sort of, and growth. If uh, we have, we have further, we have used, um, we have used, we have used sort of genetic testing in mice, as well as testing, as well as testing in human samples, to to have a, to have a, to have strong evidence that that it is in fact the key, uh, is the key, that it, it it is in fact the key pathway. Activation of this pathway in human tissues, we have looked, we have looked at over 100 patients, gives a very strong, gives, gives a very strong evidence and very strongly and, and very strongly correlated with the extent of disease. What we have is if, if, if you interfere with the signaling pathway, you, you slow down, you slow down the how disease uh, starts, you stop it, you stop it from moving forward and you induce a very substantial, a, a very, a, a very, a, a very substantial uh, regression response. Over 70% in two months, which is, which is two orders of magnitude better than, than sort of anybody has ever seen. Um, what, uh, um, what our, what our actually platform entails, uh, 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 um, is the use of uh, is the use of uh, micro OSI or OSI sort of RNAs designed uh, designed to sort of inhibit target gene signaling. It has to be an endothelial. It has to be an endothelial specific therapy, and we and we have an antiparticle platform that targets large vessel large large vessel sort of endothelial cells uh, to get this payload where where it needs to go. Uh, it is actually it is it it is actually complementary to statin or, for example, PCSK9 therapy, and it can be used um, and it can be used um, uh, with current uh, uh, with current with current um, 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 drug eluding stents. If you look if you look uh, if you look sort of if, if you look sort of if you look sort of at the pictures, it's much better that that what I can tell you, if you look if you look at the extent of disease in the mice, this is a normal this is a normal APE mice on high fat diet, and you see how extensive how how extensive the sort of diseases here. If we if we interfere with the signaling pathway, there is a 60 percent regression, and um, and the extent of disease is much less. If you look at a different part of the mouse, if you look at the different part of the mouse anatomy, you can see uh, you can see how much less uh, of this. Um, uh, or, or of this of this process you actually have that was uh, that was uh, that was done 
that was, that was done with a gene knockout, and this is the actual therapy, and this is the actual therapy where, you, where this is mice before they were treated, and this is, and this is after they have been treated. There is a 70% regression of, of the extent of fully formed mature plaques that occur in two, uh, that occur in two months. Uh, we have assembled a team of people involved in this, um, um, that involves me. Well, uh, 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 my star postdoc who has done who has done all of this work, and two experienced and two very experienced biotech executives that uh, that's been helping us devise uh, uh, and move this forward. Um, and this is this is this is how we see uh, this thing forming. Unlike most of the unlike most of the cardiovascular trials, because there is such a because such a major this, such a major loss of plug, we think that in imaging we think that an imaging a trial of about 100 patients would show, uh, would show an effect and would considerably de-risk a much larger trial. Uh, I will stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions. What's the phenotype of the knockout mouse? Um, mice, uh, mice are normal, but they do not, but they do not actually develop atherosclerosis. It is an endothelial specific knockout. So other than the athro models, are there other places where this biology plays out? And more so importantly, thinking about side effects? So uh, it is an endothelial specific process that, is, uh, that does not exist in normal, uh, in normal tissues. It, uh, it, is, it is a pathological uh, process. Interestingly enough, the same mechanism um, is probably responsible for a lot of the, for a lot of the, for a lot of the for a lot of disease in pulmonary hypertension, so that's probably the next target here. Um, we have we have done fairly extensive talk studies on our gene knockout mice, and we have not seen anything. These mice continue having very high lipid levels because we're not affecting we're not affecting cholesterol pathway as well uh, at all. So in that uh, so even though they have very high lipid levels, they still have no didn't. They, they still have no disease and no identifiable toxicity to date. As the molecule in question has been, uh, is being used in some of the cancer trials as an, as an, as an anti-cancer, as an anti-cancer approach as well. What, um, what endpoint would the FDA consider to be the approval endpoint for an atherosclerotic uh, indication? That is, a, that is an, that is an, that is an evolving target. You know, at the moment they have, they have asked for evidence of, uh, of sort of mortality, morbidity, benefit, which would take a very large twenty thousand multi-billion dollar trial. But that's because the existing drugs are not particularly effective. If you can show a 30, 50 percent reduction in, you know, in plaque size, never mind seventy that we see in mice. Uh, that may well be enough. It would uh, it would require an FDA discussion. There's been nothing like this seen. But even if it were enough, you would say that that probably eliminates the risk of a multi-billion trial going forward because we know what happens when actually plug goes away. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank okay. Next up is Jesse with uh, Sidera. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to introduce uh, Sidera. Founded in 2016 and we're developing targeted therapies against aggressive cancers. Our early focus is on invasive subpopulations of glioblastoma and important for today our engines of discovery are two platforms. So the team that I've assembled is a cohesive group with broad complementary expertise. We have a genome engineer from Yale myself, a physiologist, human physiologist, and expert in cell signaling. We have an entrepreneur and inventor, a biomedical engineer also from Yale, and then a um, world famous neurosurgeon and expert in um, glioblastoma, Dr. Q. Oops. So cutting to the chase, so here I'm showing you very aggressive uh, primary glioblastoma cells migrating on our platforms. And we have to date identified two small molecules that block this behavior. So this is a, the exact same 10-hour time-lapse film of these same human cells in the presence of our, of our inhibitor, and they have completely arrested. This is important because our same platform can quantify the aggressive nature of these same types of cells and predict the time to recurrence for these patients. 
And this is also important because these are the cells that are left behind after surgery, these invasive and highly um, aggressive cells. So why glioblastoma? This is um, a devastating disease with a very low um, mean survival rate. It's now, uh, brain cancer in general is now the leading cause of uh, childhood cancer. GBM market is expected to grow to 3.3 billion. And there's a lot of excitement and new entry in this market because of the high level of unmet need and these opportunities. So I've showed you how one of our platforms produces single cell data that allows us to understand the um, types of aggressive cells derived from patients. We can also integrate this with um, genetic discovery tools and we've rediscovered a lot of known um, druggable targets from aggressive cancers. But most importantly, we've used our own technology to identify new targets, kinase S in particular. And that's where we bring in our second platform technology. This is a highly engineered bacterial strain that allows us to precisely place protein phosphorylation, allowing us to control the activity of human proteins. So what we've achieved is functionalizing our target pathway from our GBM cells. We can then deploy a very typical robust small molecule screen, and we've come out the other end with lead candidate, kinase inhibitors. A big picture slide again showing one of our candidates at 60 uh, nanomolar in vitro. But excitingly, using again our same platform technology, we can look at the migration properties of highly aggressive primary tumors from humans, but then we can compare that to also migratory normal human astrocytes, and we see a very different response, essentially no effect in the normal cells. We've also looked at longer time scale studies, and we see an exciting reduction in viability or lack of proliferation in the same diverse population of primary human cancer cells. And this, in a snapshot, has really inspired what are now ongoing trials in, in, not in humans, in mice. This is being carried out in an exciting translational research center at the Mayo Clinic. And we are going to implant human, and are implanting human tumors in the mice and doing a multiple test to look at the efficacy of our compounds. So our financing to date. So first off at the top, we have a strong intellectual property portfolio and that's continuing to grow. We have evidence of commercial activity, but I'd like to point out for the potential investors, these are all non-exclusives. These are early partnerships that um, generate, were generated from interest in our technologies, but they are not um, exclusive. The financing is all non-dilutive. We've been um, lucky to have awards early on to pilot um, studies at Yale. We were lucky to be awarded a pitch program to develop our small molecules. The pitch program's on display here if you're interested. We have recently acquired a CT BioPipeline grant. We have a pending SBIR. And then supporting all this is a strong um, set of uh, grants to the core PIs or founders of the companies from the NIH to continue to explore uh, cancers. And this is where I will stop and I will take questions. So is intracerebral injection the ultimate delivery route, or do you need a gliadel wafer type of approach to deliver the drug? I think that we are imagining a delivery route that happens after resection. But in the lifetime it may take to get an actual drug into a trial, we're also encouraged by um, new technologies that may actually loosen up the blood-brain barrier. So I think that the market and the reality of delivering to the brain is changing radically in the next few years. Do you consider the, the lead molecule a development candidate, or are you doing additional chemistry around that? Um, it's, it's both, where it's a development candidate, additional chemistry, but our pipeline is rapid and robust, and so we're also looking for new molecule scaffolds as well. So we're not, we're not um, leaving anything to rest. Thank you. Hi, 
my name is Melissa, and I am one of the co-founders of SEPDX. This year, 751,000 people are going to be diagnosed with sepsis, a third of which are going to die, and this is going to cost hospitals $24 billion approximately. Why, is, why do people die from sepsis? They die from sepsis because it's difficult to diagnose. Currently, the diagnosis is not very specific, but it is highly sensitive. And then once they're diagnosed, the treatment pathway is very convoluted, and clinicians find themselves having a time management issue by taking care of these patients and the 30 to 40 other patients that they have to take care of. Currently, there's no sustainable way to help with diagnosing and treating these patients efficiently, so we created SEPDX. So what are we going to do? We have the electronic health record right now. We're going to pull information from the electronic health record and create something called a sepsis index, which creates a probability of a patient dying from sepsis. Then we're going to push that information over to the clinician's phone on a platform that we've built, and the clinician is either going to disagree with us or agree with us. If they agree that the patient has sepsis, then we'll send them into the treatment pathway. If they disagree with us, then we'll be able to reiterate our program right now and be able to make our analysis better. So this is the platform for a patient, for a clinician who agrees with us. We're going to take them through something called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Criteria, and those have been proven to decrease death rates from sepsis by up to 20% by using three-hour and six-hour bundles. Currently, we're partnered with a clinician in the emergency department at Yale New Haven Hospital who is a data, data analytics expert and is helping us create the sepsis index. We're going to pilot this over at the hospital and integrate into the EPIC system. We're using EPIC because it has 60% of the market right now. We're also partnered with the Yale Entrepreneur Institute as a summer fellow, and we're going through the, win the winter boost program at the refinery. Sepsis is a large market. This is 6.2% of all healthcare costs in the United States right now, accounting for $24 billion. And if you look at diagnosis codes when people leave the hospital, it's the most costly condition as of 2013. Those costs are only increasing. Between 2011 and 2013, they increased by $4 billion. There are some people out there in this marketplace right now. Currently, there are applications like Sepsis Kills and Sepsis 6, which are essentially just informational tools. So they have things like SERS criteria and QSOFA, but they don't have, to have any decision-making or data analytic process behind them. The electronic health record could honestly do this, but they're more billing focused, and that means that you need a champion within each hospital system that's gonna, actually going to build out that platform within, this, within the EHR. So we're going to do that for them. So why do hospitals want us? As of 2017, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services now requires that hospitals report patients with severe septic shock and septicemia. This is going to be tied directly to their reimbursement rate, so this affects their bottom line. On top of that, we think that we can actually lower treatment costs and decrease hospital duration stays for these patients. This is all a conjecture right now because we haven't tested this pricing out in the marketplace. Just using the data that we have from other applications similar to ours, we think that we can charge a monthly data fee. And if we have 384 hospitals within a five-year span, we could be making $15.6 million on the end of that. So this is our revenue projection cost. We think that will grow exponentially because not only can we use our technology for sepsis, but we can extend it out into other acute stage diseases in the emergency room, making our product more valuable. And this is our team. We have David Kaufman, who is a critical care medicine specialist over at NYU, and NYU has heavy interest in sepsis. I'm an administrative fellow over at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital and a recent and recently MBA graduate. We have Andrew Taylor, who is a clinical informatics uh, specialist, uh, also with analytics in the emergency department. And then on our technical side, we have Prashant and Ankur, both of which are uh, associated with SOM and have heavy uh, knowledge in IT around insurance companies and health record systems. And then we have Nidhi, Devong, and Lee, who have created our platform as it stands to date. And with that, that is Sepsis DX. Thank you. So I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is part of the problem with sepsis is not just identifying who has it or who's at risk, but the time it takes to identify the causative agent and treat it appropriately. So does the platform help at all with that side of it? Once you uh, know who has it or is at risk, identifying what 
is actually causing it. Yeah, I mean, usually, uh, so the platform will take you down kind of the standard surviving sepsis campaign criteria right now, which is to get a, a blood culture is usually how they start with that, and then doing some various imaging techniques, and our algorithm will take you through a step-by-step -step process of how to get through each of those, so you can find that causal agent more quickly. You, you mentioned that there are other um, similar programs that are charging $3,000 a month. Are, are, are docs in the ER using apps on their phone currently? A lot of doctors use applications on their phone. Um, they are, that's kind of the wave of where this type of, where medicine is going, especially centered in the emergency department, uh, which is where I spend most of my time, and mostly because we want to get from behind the computer and in front of patients. Right. So. Right. E examples of ones that are actually deployed and, and, and are able to charge for their services. I mean, right now, uh, things that are like at Yale New Haven Hospital System, they have mobile heartbeat on their phone. They do have an Epic platform on their phone. Um, they are charging monthly fees in that range. Mm -hmm. so. Is the decision making process in that in, in, in diagnosing such that is there any regulatory hurdles that? So we're hoping that we're making recommendations and not actual diagnoses with this. So we're guiding clinicians through it. So it's more of a clinical decision support tool. So we we're actually want to avoid those regulations. I'm always a little short, so I have to move the microphone. So good morning. My name is Linda Fong, and I'm a doctoral candidate in biomedical engineering. I have the pleasure of sharing with you this morning our early stage venture called Stratify, which stands for Strategic Dermatologic Engineering from Yale. I want to introduce to you our team members. Dr. Mark Saltzman is a professor of biomedical and chemical engineering here at Yale, and he's an expert in nanoparticle synthesis and drug delivery. Dr. Michael Girardi is the Vice Chair of Dermatology at the Yale School of Medicine, and he's a noted expert in skin cancer. So let's talk for a moment about skin cancer. Each year, there are more new cases of skin cancer than breast, colon, prostate, and lung cancers combined. In fact, one in five Americans will be personally affected by skin cancer over the course of their lifetime. UV exposure is the primary cause of skin cancers, which results in over 15,000 deaths in the US annually. Now, we see this growing unmet need as an opportunity for innovation in the prevention and treatment of skin cancer. We've developed a bioadhesive nanoparticle platform technology that's capable of encapsulating a range of bioactives, including sunscreen agents and chemotherapeutics. The core of this nanoparticle is composed of polylactic acid and FDA-approved material, and at the surface of the nanoparticle, you'll find a corona of hyperbranch polyglycerols which confer to the nanoparticle its bioadhesive property. Now, when we encapsulate sunscreens, we're able to create a sunscreen that is safer, longer lasting, and more effective than any other sunscreen on the market. We've demonstrated this in a high impact nature materials publication, showing that our BNPs, our bioadhesive nanoparticles, bind to the outermost layer of the skin, preventing penetration of harmful sunscreen chemicals and creating a safe solution. We're also able to provide extended 24-hour protection, and we've shown in human volunteers that we can deliver an SPF of at least 15. Now, we see the development of a sunscreen as the first step towards using this platform for a variety of indications, including the local treatment of skin cancer. Previously, Dr. Saltzman has shown in his lab that BNP delivery of epithylone B can improve survival outcomes in mice with ovarian cancers. We also have promising preclinical data that BMP delivery of camptothecin can resolve tumors in a mouse model of squamous cell carcinoma. Now, the market opportunity for Stratify is tremendous. Sunscreen and anti-aging products with an SPF component collectively comprise an $18 billion market, and we've had significant interest from industry leaders who believe this platform can be disruptive. We plan to address their questions on manufacturing and nanoparticle scale-up in order to license to the industry. We also see tremendous opportunity in the development of the platform as a local non-surgical alternative for the treatment of skin cancer. We plan to develop this with VC funding and hopefully strategic partners. Our developmental milestones for the next year focus on manufacturing and preclinical development of our anti-tumor BNPs. We've secured relationships with key CROs, including Particle Sciences and 
biomodels in order to execute these aims. In the future, we plan to license out our OTC indications, build a multi-asset therapeutic pipeline, and ultimately redefine the way we pre prevent and treat skin cancer. Thank you. Can I answer any questions? That's something we can definitely help secure the answer on once we know more about the manufacturing. But at the moment, we're estimating about $50, $50 for a vinyl product of 1.7 ounces. Anything else? Thank you. Everyone in, this, everyone in this room knows that diabetes is a major debilitating disease. At one and a half million new patients every single year, it's a fair bet that you either are a diabetic, you know a diabetic, or you're at least worried you might become a diabetic. What you may not know is that $32 billion are spent every year for drugs that are uh, chronically administered simply to support uh, um, maintenance of your blood glucose, symptomatic treatment. There is no drug that is designed for short-term treatment that actually addresses causes of the disease. <clears throat> the problem comes down to the beta cell, which is what produces uh, insulin. In diabetics, there's an increased demand for insulin, which puts stress on the beta cell. Eventually, they start to die. The reason the beta cells are dying is because there's another hormone secreted with insulin called IAPP. And under diabetic stress, this protein self-assembles into an oligomer, which is itself toxic. So the disease, diabetes, can be modified if we can modify this gain of toxic function in IAPP. The, the, um, we can reproduce this IAPP toxicity ex vivo using clusters of cells called islets by simply taking these mini organs and incubating them in elevated glucose. They start producing insulin like mad, and the cells start to die. You're looking at two such mini organs right now. Okay. They're stained, uh, immunostained red to show you where the insulin secreting cells are. And on the left, you can see lots of voids. That's because the cells are, are, are dying. Our solution is a design molecule, ADM116, uh, that binds IEPP. And if that's included in this uh, incubation, the cells don't die. You retain a, a healthy phenotype. All of this comes from a lot of basic research, which is now done. Okay? We know IPP is an unstructured peptide that in diabetics self-assembles into amyloid. My competitors have spent too many years uh, being, uh, giving all of their attention to amyloid. Amyloid is not toxic. They've been distracted, and so they don't have what we have. Okay? It's IPP oligomers inside cells punching holes in membranes that causes toxicity. We've paired this with a research program looking at the synthesis of small molecules that are designed to mimic the properties of intact proteins. What we discovered is that if you make a, pro a, a small molecule that mimics the compact state of a, of a protein, we can use that to induce structure into these unstructured peptide targets. So the winning platform allowed us to create this molecule, ADM116. We're super excited about this molecule. If you look at it as it's spinning around, you will see a greasy interior. You will see an internal hydrogen bonding network keeping it uh, together. But what's important is that this is a water-soluble uh, compound. It can unfold a little bit to expose some grease and passively get across a membrane. And once it's inside there, it finds IPP, it binds to it specifically, and it induces structure in that target. We even know what the mode of action is. So you've been seeing uh, my logo on all of the slides. This logo is actually the mode of action. The sphere you're looking at, the brown sphere, is just a mitochondria. The green is oligomeric IPP that's self-assembled into a, a toxin porating a membrane. 
And the action of, of ADM116 is to change the size of those pores by about a hundredfold. So with this uh, knowledge in my pocket, I've assembled a team at ADM Therapeutics. That team includes expertise in preclinical development, animal models, and synthetic chemistry. <clears throat> uh, and we, we have a, a plan for the next few years to get us from where we are today to an IND filing with the FDA. The basic research is done. We have a lead. We validated the lead in vitro and ex vivo. What we need to do now is to make a modest number of variants of, of ADM116, take this through a, a series of assays designed to filter us down to the one candidate that we're going to move forward uh, into clinical trial. We have a really good idea how to structure this program because we know what we'd like this molecule to, to do and what we think it's capable of doing. It's a brand new mode of action. There is nothing like it. It acts by preventing IPP-induced apoptosis. We think this molecule can function on, as a short-term therapeutic treatment. This is really important because it means short-term trials uh, you know, don't suffer nearly as much from concerns about mutagenicity and toxicity that so plague the long-term chronic assessment of molecules for these kinds of trials. This drug should appeal greatly to big pharma. Many of the drugs on the market by big pharma depend on healthy beta cells. This drug will keep those beta cells healthy, allowing a much longer market lifetime for those drugs. And finally, some people will experience partial or complete remission of the disease. Thank you. If you comment a little bit on the clinical trial here that would be required to show an effect of decreasing islet amyloid, and then a follow-up question as well. The length of the trial required. So the, the length of the trial to, in, at, at the stage of, of animals in, in humans? Where humans from a sort of a POC, hum right? Because So the expectation is that this should be a treatment that takes place over a small number of weeks, three to five weeks. Standard blood draw tests would be, uh, would be used. And the, and the standards for observing improvement in beta cell health are, are there in the blood draw, like a glucose tolerance test. So, so that's the length of time that, that an expectation would be, uh, would be put in place to observe uh, a, a clinical effect. Any preclinical models of the transgenics, or are you planning on doing anything in higher species that actually naturally accumulate amyloid? So the, the, the preclinical would be done in, um, there are two really great uh, rodent models. Uh, and then pre-IND talk studies would also then be done in a, in a non-rodent non, uh, model. Do you have a sense for dosing, just given the mechanism and the you know, one-to-one stoichiometry, given it's not a catalytic activity that you have? Um, yeah, the, 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 in terms of the mechanism of, the, of, the, of that interaction? Uh, we do. We've, I mean, our basic view is, is that this is um, the assemblies that we're actually looking at are actually quite fluid. Uh, and so these are phase changes in membranes that are generating these porated uh, states. And so a good way to think about this, uh, I like to think about this as more like antifreeze. Okay, you don't put one-to-one -one water in your carburetor to, to you know, keep it from overflowing or freezing, but you're changing uh, the critical point at which you generate these structures that are toxic. Hello everyone and thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this venture idea, early venture idea uh, from us. So this um, technology is based upon a uh, groundbreaking discovery in my lab made, uh, we made last year and which is about a novel DNA modification we are talking about in the next few slides and N6 methyl A and which plays a critical role in a variety of cancer stem cells. And uh, at FP position, as we uh, indicated before, is we are the sole pioneer of this technology, so basically we we'll have no competitors at this point. And uh, a patent has been uh, filed uh, uh, early this year. And the goal of the company is to uh, fully develop inhibitors against the methyltransferases and reader modules of this modification. And 
I'm uh, currently the associate professor at uh, Yale Stem Cell Center and Department of Genetics. Uh, I'm recognized with my expertise in epigenetics, biochemistry, uh, cell biology, and cancer biology. So if we have, have the next slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, as I told you before, this is the, the new base in our genome. And as you know that ever since in the 40s and 50s last century that we figured out our DNA is composed of four bases, A, G, T, C, then our dream is to find additional bases. But this effort has been actually not very successful in the last uh, about five decades. Only two bases have been so far have been discovered. One is 5-methyl-C in the, in the 70s, and second is this one uh, discovered by us last year. So it's pretty remarkable, I think, it's, it's in every and uh, each and every uh, person in this room, uh, we actually have a additional hidden component of our genome, or left untold for all these years. So what is this about in, in terms of disease? So we figure out that this modification usually is very low in adult tissues, and you almost cannot detect its expression level but it's highly upregulated in a variety of cancer stem cells at end stage of tumors which are resistant to chemotherapy. So um, we, we, left, uh, we showed these two examples, ovarian cancer and glioblastoma, because these two types of cancers are notorious for their resistance to chemotherapy. You can see the black dots here as indicating the levels is in the, uh, at least uh, increased by about 50 to 100 fold. So this also applied to a variety of other cancers, including breast cancer and pancreatic. I think this list is ever growing. So we also figure out what's the function of this modification. It's related to the selection of cancer stem cells. So cancer stem cells is, un, is paradoxically is selected under a low oxygen condition. So as you imagine that the tumor, when tumor grow at the final stage, and uh, the cells in the middle uh, fast-growing tumors actually uh, have very limited access to oxygen and glucose. So most of cells, mammalian cells, in this situation will die, but cancer stem cells cancer stem cell somehow miraculously survive and then uh, flourish. So we figure out the, the, the mechanism they're uh, they doing that is by putting 6MA, this modification, on the genes related to cell death. So if hypoxia induced cell death, this modification will stop the cell, uh, cell death genes from expressing, so they're thereby uh, rendering the cells with growth advantage. So as you can imagine, this becomes a very attractive target. Um, we figure out several of the methyltransferases for this modification, and I can point out that methyltransferases basically uh, are highly upregulated in a variety of human cancers, in, in, if not all the human cancers. And you can see, when you knock them out, then you basically extended the, the lifespan of the mice of the PDX model, uh, very significantly in the GBM model. So encouraged by that, we also developed a HTS assay to screen for small molecules that can inhibit the uh, muscle transferases of this modification. And we're lucky to uh, have at least one strong hit and this molecule can stop 6MA level in at a nanomolar range from 100 to 400 nanomolar and also stop uh, the uh, very tough uh, cancer stem cells from uh, proliferating at this range as well. So at this point, um, our goal, immediate goal, uh, uh, this research is funded by uh, internal funding from Yale Medical School and we s want to screen additional specific inhibitors for the variety of uh, several of the methyl transferases we discovered, and also we want to evaluate uh, inhibitors uh, in several models, such as ovarian and glioblastoma. And we also, uh, in a position, we're hoping to attract additional venture capitals to fully develop the lead compounds we have now, and then evaluate these compounds in uh, uh, several models, in, all, in nearly probably more, all, all the human tumor models, this, because 6MA is upregulated uh, in the majority of the cancers. And also, uh, we'll just use this money for the P, uh, PD and PK studies and for the position to uh, uh, start clinical trial in three or five years. Thank you, and welcome questions. Does, uh, does inhibiting the methyltransferases or the readers just 
uh, induce the cancer stem cells to undergo spontaneous apoptosis? Do you have to apply a chemotherapy to get that to happen, or does it also perhaps induce differentiation? Uh, no, I, I think it's clearly it's cell death. It, you don't have you don't need to anything else to uh, to kill them, and then they will spontaneously develop cell death. Hi, uh, my name is Alana Shepartz. I'm a Sterling professor here at Yale, associated primarily with the Department of Chemistry. Um, and I'm grateful to, for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our science and our ideas. Um, so I'm sure everyone in this room recognizes that there is an enormous opportunity available if someone were to figure out how to move proteins, therapeutic enzymes, antibodies, protein mimetics out of endosomes and into the cytosol reproducibly and with high efficiency. I believe that we've discovered just that type of technology and we'd like to now apply it to deliver the enzyme arginino-succinate synthetase um, to the liver of patients who are suffering from a disease known as type 1 citrullinemia. So about eight years ago, an extremely astute postdoctoral in my lab noticed that some of the miniature proteins that we were making that were minimally cationic, carrying five arginines on a well-structured alpha helical scaffold, were magically escaping from endosomes into the cytosol. And over the past eight years, in research funded by the NIH, we've been able to learn about the robustness of this technology and the breadth of its applications. And so, for example, what we've learned is that um, these molecules, which we call cell permeable miniature proteins, are able to reach the cytosol and the nucleus with efficiencies of greater than 70, of, in best cases, greater than 75 percent. What we've established is that in all cases that we have tested, they are vastly superior to any of the cell penetrating peptides with which you are familiar. The delivery efficiency is not quantified, is not estimated through some amplifiable biological technique, but we measure the concentration in the cytosol and nucleus directly using a spectroscopic technique, a sophisticated spectroscopic technique known as fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which provides you exactly the concentration of the molecule in the cytosol and nucleus and exactly its diffusion constant. Um, we've shown that we can deliver protein payloads whose molecular weights range from 10 to 32 kilodaltons. And in the case of the 32 kilodalton protein, we know that the payloads are active. The stability of the cell penetrating miniature proteins are high but tunable. To the extent that we've invest investigated their toxicity, they are non-toxic, in many cases up to high micromolar concentrations. And the best news is that they're genetically encodable and easily manufactured because they're simply fusion proteins. The key difference between these cell penetrating miniature proteins and the classic molecules with which you are familiar is that these molecules utilize a defined mechanism to escape from endosomes that makes use of a new but exciting endosome remodeling complex that facilitates their exit. Um, the OCR people would yell at me if I didn't tell you that there are fundamental patents and applications that cover both the scaffold and the delivery. This just gives you a sense of, the, of how the molecules perform. Um, you know, we, whoops, so we, this now investigates their efficacy to deliver enzyme one, enzyme two, or an antibody mimetic. In so the, the bars that you should look at are the ones at the right where those are, uh, those are cases in which the enzyme or antibody mimetic are linked to one of our cell penetrating miniature proteins. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is that the concentration that we reach in the cytosol and or nucleus is significantly greater than what is ob certainly observed with the protein or antibody mimetic itself, 
or even in cases where we've done head-to-head -head comparisons with cell penetrating peptides with which you are aware, okay, the increase in concentration in the cytosol is truly dramatic. So citrus, we, 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 view as, we view CTLN1 as a beautiful proof of principle, tech, proof, proof of principle, right? So it is an incurable disease that results from a deficiency or absence of the first cytosolic enzyme in the urea cycle. Patients who, who are diagnosed with type 1 citrullinemia suffer from hyperanemia, um, which can cause irreversible neurologic dam damage, coma, or death if not treated. The current treatments involves um, basically scavengers for ammonia, and in some cases, liver transplants, but even the liver transplants are not curable. There are 15, there are 19,000 patients in the US and Europe. We believe that even a 10% increase in activity would be disease modifying. The market is high, and as I say, we view this as simply a proof of principle that this technology can deliver an active enzyme to an animal and reverse um, and reverse a disease. We believe it's um, superior to all technologies uh, or available treatments for CTLN1 or other cell penetrating peptide technologies, and we have a, a very well outlined uh, strategic plan to reach the position where um, where we would have a material that couldn't that was efficacious in an animal. Um, and if you thought our skills were limited to simply science, I just want to point out that um, in collaboration with my team member, Rebecca Wisner, we actually designed this logo, <laughs> which we think is really cool. So um, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Other than, other than the enzyme replacement modality, have you done any experiments where you've been able to try to block protein proteins? Um, the antibody mimetic, whose data I showed you, that antibody mimetic is in fact a protein-protein interaction inhibitor. Do you have any sense for potential immunogenicity risk compared to other platforms? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, so I would argue that uh, there are ways to construct our vehicle so that it is not proteolized as well as unstructured peptides which would inhibit its ability to be cleaved and presented by MHC molecules. Um, I would say that the protein that we're using is not human-based, right? But I suspect that the tools that are used to modify antibodies so that they are more humanized could also be applied to our scaffold as well, since it's just a protein. A small protein, but a protein. You know, the question in terms of tissue types that you can target in vivo, obviously liver, how about other? We don't have Cell information types. that it would be wonderful to be able to share that we don't have that information yet. 